creme de la creme of uh, academic existence, but, but I'm, uh, I'm really glad I will be able to spend this uh, year uh, among you. So uh, if uh, some of you feel disposed to, uh, to, to have a chat about late antiquity, uh, religious history, or uh, even about your own research with a complete ignoramus, here I am, uh, uh, and uh, and I'm talking to especially to, to this to 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 graduate and students and uh, uh, and uh, um, and doctoral students. Uh, well, this is what uh, the sabbatical year is also for. Uh, the title of my paper um, uh, is a bit uh, is long, a bit too long, uh, uh, and uh, and still it misses one uh, element. Uh, it should be. Uh, uh, let me check whether I'm able to. Yes, uh, it should be some relics, a bishop, a curse, four sermons and two miracles <laughs> uh, constructing the gold of a saint uh, in a late uh, in late antique uh, hippo. Uh, and the, the, the miracles are crucial. Uh, uh, the miracles are crucial because believing miracles uh, produced by the power of martyrs uh, was a potent uh, force behind the development uh, of the uh, of the cult. Uh, people traveled uh, sometimes from afar, uh, seeking healing at their graves. Uh, they took home uh, various tokens of their power. They wrote, uh, copied, uh, and read stories uh, about the cures obtained through their uh, agency. Uh, they brought gifts and funded churches in gratitude for the received grace. And by doing all this, they strengthened the cults locally and helped to spread them through Christendom. Thus, uh, miracles uh, were important, and we can hardly understand not only the development of the cult of saints, but also the broader uh, religious evolution in late antiquity uh, if we ignore them. However, for historians, uh, Dealing with miracles is like skating on ice. Uh, we can study literary functions uh, of miracle stories. We can analyze um, healing or divinatory uh, rituals, but only very rarely uh, we are able to say what really happened uh, at the tombs uh, of saints. And uh, as historians uh, uh, in the early 21st century, we are generally speaking not very fond in this question. Uh, but what really happened is important. Uh, and when saying this, I'm not thinking about the well mechanics or, or, or medical aspect uh, uh, of healing miracles, real or not, uh, but uh, about the immediate context about uh, expectations and reactions of those who witness them and about their direct impact uh, on the popularity of the cults, uh, the role of the sanctuary, the position of the bishop uh, and beliefs uh, of uh, the people. The problem is that while miracle stories may tell us a lot about topography, staff, rituals or economy uh, of the sanctuaries, it is more difficult to reconstruct on their basis the dynamics of the events which took place in the healing shrines. Uh, this concerns both occasional miracle accounts uh, and uh, uh, collections of miracles associated with different sanctuaries of saints, such as St. Tecla in Seleucia, Cosmas and Damian on, uh, in Constantinople, Artemios in the same city, Menas in Abumena, and so on, and uh, uh, so on. These collections may seem to uh, consist of well, authentic testimonies simply bound together uh, by an editor, but in fact they are not. Uh, some episodes are hardly based on authentic stories at all. Other migrated from one collection to another, uh, and all were heavily elaborated, often a long time uh, after the events they describe. They do not necessarily record anxieties, hope, uh, and reactions of those who witnessed what they considered God's miracle, miraculous interventions uh, in the course of human life. Only rarely uh, can we find a narrative uh, written 
really close to the event and giving us a glimpse into the emotions which uh, accompanied it. Uh, a good example is uh, letter 77 uh, of Ambrose of Milan uh, addressed to his sister Marcella, in which he describes the discovery of the relics of Gervasius and Protasius, the healings which followed and the mockery of his enemies who claimed that the, that the pretended cures were a swindle planned uh, by the bishop. Of course, this text, uh, written by the man who organized the discovery and tried to capitalize on it, is far from providing, a, providing an impartial uh, narrative of the events which took place in Milan in 386. But it tells us a lot about, about the agenda of the bishop, the suspicions of his adversaries, uh, and the expectations of the people. An even more interesting piece of evidence tells us of two miraculous healings uh, which took place a generation after the events described by Ambrose uh, and in the region this series of uh, seminars uh, is focused on. It was authored by Augustine, who in 386 uh, still as a layman witnessed the discovery of Gervasius and Protasius in Milan and in 396 became the Bishop of Hippo. He left us an enormous collection of uh, about 130 sermons uh, on the feasts of martyrs, but also mentioned various aspects of their cult in many, uh, uh, many, others, uh, uh, many other writings. Uh, you can find them all uh, uh, well easily brought together in the cult of saints in later antiquity database that uh, Amy uh, has just mentioned. The database, which is a, a, a fruit of collaboration between Oxford, Warsaw, and Reading. Uh, the evidence uh, uh, I will uh, discuss today consists of uh, four sermons delivered in Easter week of 400. 25. They are all connected with a dramatic story of 10 siblings from Caesarea in Cappadocia who were supposedly cursed by their, by, by their mother, uh, started to tremble in their limbs and scattered through the world uh, looking for a cure. Two of them, who as we know uh, from an, uh, a summary account of this story given by Augustine, uh, in uh, uh, in the city of God, uh, the city of God, a year or two later, uh, were called Paul and Palladia, and they found their way to Africa. On Eastern Sunday, uh, 425, we find them in Hippo. Now, just before Easter Mass, uh, Augustine was made aware of a great commotion uh, uh, in the church, and several people came telling him. Uh, that Paul had just been miraculously healed when praying at the memorial shrine uh, containing the relics of St. Stephen. Augustine uh, entered the church and delivered a very short homily, uh, no more than a minute long, uh, preserved as Sermon 320. He told his audience that while they were accustomed to listening to written accounts libelli, of the miracles of Stephen, the present miracle was attested by the very sight of the man who had just been healed, and there is no much a sermon could add to this. Also, after the fast and vigil, Augustine was simply too tired to continue. We can understand him very well. On Easter Monday, uh, Augustine preached another very short sermon, 321. He said that he had spoken to the man healed the day before and learned many interesting things, which after all deserved a libellus. He promised, or the written account, he promised this account to be made and read on the following day. On Tuesday, both siblings stood up in the church in the chancel before the people to make everybody see the difference which the miracle had produced. And the libellus of the brother was read aloud. 
and it is preserved as Sermon 322. In it, uh, Paul tells about his mother, insulted by her eldest son, the silent, accept the silent acceptance of this abuse uh, from other siblings, and the wrath of the offended woman who decided to curse the wicked son, and then, at the instigation of a demon, uh, all other children as well. Paul claims uh, that after the curse, within one year, uh, all the siblings in, all, in, in the order of seniority started to tremble in their limbs. Seeing the result of the curse, cast in anger, their mother committed suicide, and the siblings dispersed through the world looking for healing. Um. Uh, sometime later, and uh, may I ask uh, all the participants whether they have their uh, microphones off, because we, uh, we, we hear some, some noises. Sorry for that. Uh, uh, um, so, sometime later, the eldest son, the, the, the eldest brother, was cured at the shrine of St. Lawrence uh, at Ravenna. As for Paul and Palladia, uh, they picked up uh, their way through whatever lands they ascertained that they were holy places in which God was working miracles. They visited Ancona in central Italy, which had some relics of St. Stephen, but were not cured. Then they came to Uzalis. Um, 150 miles uh, uh, east of Hippas, the crow flies, another place in which the relics of the saint were deposited. But nothing happened there either. Yet on, on the 1st of January, Paul saw in a vision a man of noble aspect who for, foretold him that he would be healed in three months' time. And now he recognizes this man as Augustine. The vision repeated uh, in other places, which suggests that uh, the siblings kept traveling. Finally, two weeks before Easter, they arrived in Hippo, and since then, uh, they have uh, prayed every day at the memorial shrine of St. Stephen. And here, just before the Mass during which Sermon 320 uh, was preached, Paul was finally healed. When the reading uh, uh, of the account had been completed, uh, Paul quit the chancel and went to pray uh, together with his sister at the relics. Here ends Sermon 322. But this is an artificial division because Augustine preached Sermon 323 immediately afterwards. Uh, he emphasized the moral of the story. Children should respect parents. Parents should control their anger asked his congregation to pray for the healing of Palladia and expressed his hope that they would see it happen. He probably uh, liked uh, the story, uh, sorry, uh, uh, probably liked uh, the, the story about the vision in which he himself, a venerable man with white hair, had announced to the siblings uh, 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 the forthcoming cure uh, as he mentioned it in the sermon, although he added, what am I that all unknowingly I should have appeared to these two? Even more importantly, uh, he was pleased by what had happened in Hippo and probably by what had not happened earlier in Ancona and Uzalis. He made some ironic comments about the history of the relics presumably deposited in Ancona claiming that, in fact, what people venerated there was not a corporeal relic, uh, by a stone, but a stone used uh, during the lapidation of St. Stephen, uh, which had been kept there of old, and only recently uh, came to be considered a fragment uh, of the martyr's arm, because ankon means elbow in Greek. Augustine just started to tell another story uh, concerning a miracle which had occurred at Uzaris, but here the sermon breaks. We learn from a few sentences added uh, by its redactor that at this moment, people gathered at the shrine of St. Stephen, which must have been adjacent to or be a part of the main basilica, 
began to shout, God be thanked, Christ be praised. Palladia was killed. Augustine briefly commented upon this and finished the sermon. The following day, Easter Wednesday, uh, he had another relatively short sermon in which he finished the story of the miracle in Osalis and once again gave vent to his civic pride, saying, so couldn't God have cured these two in a place where he performed such a miracle as through his martyr? And yet they were directed here to us. Augustine's sermons uh, were recorded, uh, often recorded by stenographers, and these ones look very much authentic. Uh, this can be seen in their vividness and numerous allusions, uh, which were perfectly understandable uh, for the real audience, but not so much for those who read the sermons afterwards. Uh, in Sermon 320, Augustine mentioned his fatigue. He was, he was uh, more or less 70 then, and claiming that the testimony of the eyes is superior to written evidence uh, said, this once written evidence is the sight of him, libellus huius aspectus est. Well, he evidently means Paul, whom people could see at that moment, but the reader, before coming to Sermon 321, uh, uh, or to the account uh, in the city of God, hardly knows what Augustine is talking about uh, uh, and whom the demonstrative huius refers to. This is not explained in the sermon. Uh, sermon 321 shows that the preacher suddenly changed his mind and decided to present a deli bellus to his audience. He didn't mean it uh, um, the day before. Sermon 323, is interrupted by the cries from the crowd and breaks in the middle of the story. Well, all this suggests that while these sermons could have been ed edited later, or certainly were edited later, uh, they were really preached during and just after real events and in reaction to them. These days, something must have happened in Hippo, and this dossier gives us a glimpse uh, into Augustine's and up to a point, uh, his flock's immediate reaction to the miracle. But the story of Paul and Palladia and the healing is quite curious. Uh, we learn uh, about 10 siblings from distant Cappadocia, touched in the order respecting seniority by a mysterious illness resulting from a curse. Well, this sounds as the beginning of a soul uplifting, but rather fictitious tale. But even more unlikely is the idea of seeking a cure in the holy places in Italy or Africa, which at that time could hardly compete with famous shrines uh, in the East. In Cappadocia itself, uh, there were many sanctuaries uh, of saints, uh, um, of healer saints uh, 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 in Caesarea, the city Paul and Palladia came from, uh, uh, had uh, um, several shrines of martyrs and the miracles which occurred at least one of them, uh, that of St. Mamas, are attested uh, already in the 370s, many decades, decades earlier than in any healing sanctuary in the West. In the 420s, when one was looking from the East, Western material shrines, with the sole exception of those of Peter and Paul, uh, were completely invisible. And even these two in Rome were hardly considered places of healing. So going west uh, in search of a cure was a very, very strange idea. Thus, I think that the story of Paul and Palladia is unlikely to be true. And also, there are a few factors which suggest that the same can be say, said about the miracles which healed them. Uh, the first, the perfect timing. 
Paul's healing uh, took place on Eastern Sunday when the big crowd, crowd gathered at the Episcopal Basilica of Hippo. Someone who needed an audience for a spectacle of healing could hardly choose a better moment. Second, a breathtaking arrangement. The day after Paul's cure, the siblings are shown publicly in the church. Everybody can see the difference. The emotions and expectations are very high and suddenly they are met. Uh, Palladia is cured right in the middle of the sermon devoted to the miracle which had restored health to her brother. Third, the libellus, uh, which was uh, written on Monday and read out on Tuesday, is unlikely to be an expromptu composition. Its elegant style, construction, vividness, and as we shall see, the message of the story strongly suggests that it had been well prepared and thought over beforehand. Now, uh, if the sermons are authentic and preached on the spot, but the story of the siblings and their healing is not, I think that we have to assume that the miracle was staged. Uh, and we know that the staged miracles happened. Uh, uh, the most famous, if ironic, description of a cult which grew upon arranged miracles and divinatory responses come from the second century treatise uh, Alexander the False Prophet by Lucian of Samosata, which tells the story of the successful uh, foundation uh, of the shrine uh, of the serpent god Glicon in Abonotechos. Uh, Fodul Deus, uh, an African author slightly younger than Augustine, describes a man named Florus, seized by the spirit of seduction not far from the city of Naples, who claimed to have the merits and power of St. Sosius the martyr, and was promising and doing illicit things for the destruction of the souls. But he did miracle, performed miracles, uh, uh, or claimed to. Uh, later on, Gregor of Tours talks about impostors claiming to be in constant contact with the apostles and possessing powerful relics of St. Vincent and Felix. And as we have seen, even closer in time to the events in Hippo in 386, uh, Ambrose of Milan was accused of organizing a cure of a few false demoniacs in order to authenticate the veracity of the relics of Gervasius and Protasius, which he had just discovered close to the city. And this case is uh, particularly important because it shows that in a successful staging, uh, the role of the healed was equally important to that of the healer or provider of the healing power. Uh, as it has been said already, Augustine was a witness of this event. And indeed, when trying to, to, to identify the person who organized uh, the miracle in Hippo, we can find arguments pointing uh, to the bishop, uh, uh, for whom some elements uh, of the story were strangely convenient. First of all, uh, the miracle demonstrated the veracity of the relics of St. Stephen, which he had recently deposited in the city. Uh, this was an important and by no means self-evident uh, issue. As we have seen, uh, Augustine himself mocked at the pretensions of Ancona, uh, which claimed to possess St. Stephen's elbow. In Africa, the arrival of the new, relic, uh, the, the new relics of St. Stephen uh, uh, caused enthusiasm, but also doubts. This can be seen, for instance, uh, in the first chapter of the collection of the miracles of St. Stephen, uh, written in 420s in Uzalis, and attesting to a series of miracles which took place in that city thanks to their power. Uh, in the first episode of this collection, we can see a scene in which a woman hears about the forthcoming transfer of the relics, but hardly believes they are really the bones of the martyr. The authenticity of these relics uh, may have been 
particularly difficult to accept because they were quite unprepossessing. Uh, the women mentioned above saw in a vision uh, an ample inside of which, uh, uh, an ample the inside of which looked as if it was sprinkled with blood and had something like traces of tiny straws which seemed to be particles of bones. And the author of the collection explains that it was how the relics brought to Uzalis actually looked like. Uh, on, on this slide, uh, uh, you can see a reliquary with a similar uh, content and uh, the similar type of, uh, of the reliquary discovered by my colleagues from the uh, Faculty of Archaeology in Hippos, Suzita in Palestine. Uh, Augustine, in a different sermon, acknowledges that Hippo Regius, another Hippo, uh, didn't receive anything else than just a handful of the saints' ashes either. Apparently, the material form of these relics didn't guarantee their authenticity, and some people doubted that these were indeed the remains of the first martyr. That was all the more so, as distrust uh, toward relics brought from afar was a broader phenomenon. In late antiquity, not every bone from distant countries was unanimously considered to be a relic of a saint, and uh, some skepticism, skepticism was normal. Uh, we can see it, for instance, in the life of Severinus of Noricum, who, according to its author, Eugipius, united the relics of many martyrs. He was always deigned to know about them beforehand by revelation, for he knew that the enemy often creeps in under the name of holiness. So the veracity of relics may have been problematic also for the committed supporters of their cult. Secondly, uh, the healing of Paul and Palladia must have strengthened the belief in the power of relics held in Hippo. Of course, uh, we, we may think that this belief was, was granted, uh, uh, as in the long run, the cult of St. Stephen's relics uh, was an enormous Christendom-wide uh, success. Uh, it spread very swiftly through the Mediterranean. It produced several, uh, several popular texts mentioning miracles. Uh, two of them gave rise to a new, uh, to, to, to new literary genre, the Revelatio Sancti Stefani, which describes the, fun, the, the, the finding of the saint's grave, uh, set a pattern of the Inventio story, which was to flourish for many centuries to come. Uh, the collection of the miracles performed uh, by his relics at Uzalis, the Miracula Sancti Stefani, is the earliest representant of this popular literary genre. But in 425, the su this success wasn't evident yet. Uh, the grave of St. Stephen in Kafargamala in Palestine was discovered only in 415 and the relics reached Africa only around 420, and Hippo probably in 423 or, or maybe even uh, uh, 24. In, this, in spring 425, the belief in their power was probably developing swiftly, but certainly wasn't an established uh, phenomenon. And Augustine had reasons to be afraid uh, that their unprepossessing character could have discouraged people from seeking healing uh, at the new shrine of St. Stephen, uh, built just a year before uh, or so. Uh, this, that uh, the relics brought to Hippo uh, were just, well, a handful of ashes and nothing more uh, really mattered. Uh, in the treatise, Praising the saints, uh, um, Augustine's contemporary, Victricus of Rouen, repeatedly claims that even a tiny particle or a handful of ashes of saints have the same power as the complete bodies. But this recurrent assertion suggests that the conviction he tries to instill in his audience wasn't widely shared. Apparently, the expectation of a miracle was proportional to the completeness of the body. Thus, Augustine certainly 
may have been afraid that some members of his congregation uh, uh, could be hesitant about the miraculous power of the ashes uh, which he had been recently, uh, 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 which he had uh, recently brought uh, to the city. It was all the more so uh, uh, as the belief in contemporary miracles, in the miracles which happen here and now, uh, in general, was not self-evident at that time. Uh, in the third and early fourth century, uh, Christians obviously believed in the miracles of old, performed by, uh, by Moses, the, the prophets, Jesus and the apostles, but they didn't really expect them to occur again in their lifetime. Uh, the belief in miracles uh, 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 in the uh, um, in the third and early fourth century uh, was almost dead. Uh, certain, this belief uh, uh, reappeared in Christianity and started to spread quite quickly uh, around mid fourth century, but in Africa it was still a very new phenomenon, uh, unattested and most probably absent before the arrival of the relics of St. Stephen. Even Augustine himself for a long time thought that the era of miracles was over. He repeated that the only miracles that we can witness are the miraculous sunrises and sunset, and that's all. Uh, uh, by 425, uh, he certainly changed his mind. Uh, but I think that he wanted to be sure that others would do the same. The third reason uh, why the healing of Paul and Palladia was convenient for Augustine is that it strengthened the position of Hippo on the map of the holy places holding the relics of St. Stephen. Both the Libellos uh, and uh, Augustine's Sermon 323 emphasize that the siblings visited uh, the, the siblings' visits to uh, Ancona and Uzalis, which had the relics of St. Stephen earlier than Hippo, turned out to be fruitless. Uh, of course, Augustine didn't look at these cities with any, well, profound hostility. Uh, Ancona was just too far to pose any danger uh, to the position of Hippo uh, uh, in ecclesiastical or, well, any other uh, sphere. As for Uzalis, its bishop, Evodius, was Augustine's friend. The same can be, sent, uh, can be said about uh, Posidius of Kalama, another African city which obtained St. Stephen's relics before Hippo and possibly other places which may have got them through Augustine's uh, ecclesiastical uh, network. But strangely enough, uh, Hippo received these relics later than Kalama and Uzalis. And this may have made Augustine anxious about the position of the new shrine he constructed in his church. Uh, in the Mediterranean, the competition uh, between uh, cities, especially from the same region, was an old uh, and uh, widespread phenomenon. And it found new expression uh, in the cult of saints. Now, this also concerns Africa. Uh, uh, some African passiones explicitly talk about uh, the civic character uh, uh, of their heroes and the rivalry between the cities which had their bodies is evident. Uh, also, uh, we know that in Uzaris, the local population, uh, population at some point uh, uh, firmly protested when Bishop Evodius tried to transfer a portion of the relics held there to another church, well, probably because it would weaken the position of their city. Obviously, no African city could comp compete with Carthage, but Uzalis, as well as Kalama and a few other places which received the relics of the first martyr were the rivals in Hippos' wife class. Fourth thing, Paul's story boosted Augustine's personal authority. Uh, as he was the man from the vision, aspecto claros et candido crine uh, venerabilis. Augustine reflected much uh, on the visions in which people saw and sometimes talked to the living or dead. 
and he thought uh, that such apparitions were not real meetings because those who appeared in them were not aware of it. Nevertheless, he recognized that such visions in which people saw saints could have been produced by God, who wanted to honor in this way his special servants. Of course, we may think that at that time, Augustine's authority in and outside Africa didn't need this kind of boost. But Paul, who in his testimony given in the church full of people directly identified the man from the vision with Augustine, quite evidently played this card. And we have already seen that Augustine, who returned to this point in his sermon, well, most probably liked it. In all, Augustine had reasons to enjoy and advertise the story of Paul and Palladia and their miraculous healing for the benefit of the audience who got a message uh, in more than one respect, uh, which in more than one respect uh, served very well his cause. Uh, one may even argue that he took care to pass his message in a more nuanced way than Ambrose, whose direct involvement in the miracles which followed the discovery of Gervasius and Protasius had been evident and widely discussed uh, by his enemies. But somehow, for me, it is difficult uh, to accept that Augustine actually staged uh, the miracle, even if he deemed it would be to the advantage uh, of his flock. Uh, in a treatise, De Mendacchio, written about 30 years earlier, he very firmly rejected a notion that one might tell a lie for the sake of doing good. He took a very similar position in a long exchange of letters uh, um, between himself and Jerome, lasting from 384 to 404. Finally, in the very 420s, uh, uh, the same years in which the relics of St. Stephen arrived uh, in Africa and Paul and Palladia visited Hippo, he wrote one more treatise on lie, uh, Contra Mendacium, uh, in which he once again condemned its instrumental use even to such a good end as the correction and conversion of heretics. Obviously, what a man, uh, what a man writes and uh, what he does may be two completely uh, different things, uh, but I think that we need at least to consider another explanation uh, uh, than Augustine's fall play. Uh, it may be that the trickery was an initiative of Paul and Palladia, wandering impostors who traveled from one city to another, uh, possibly repeating the spectacle of healing. Uh, the same elements in Paul's libellus, which conveyed so well Augustine's message, can be read as fabrications aimed at disarming the bishop. Paul told Augustine about the siblings' quest for healing in famous holy places uh, in which they sadly uh, hadn't found it. Uh, and that was already good for Augustine. Uh, we can see it in his malicious comments uh, uh, about Ancona. Uh, the same is true of another element of Paul's tale, clearly targeting Augustine, a vision which presented him as a venerable man and a prophet. Uh, it wouldn't be a wonder that the siblings spared no effort to convince Augustine. The impostors needed to have the bishop on their side. The episodes uh, told by Codwold Deus and Gregor of Tours, which I have mentioned, show that the authority uh, of the bishop was essential for confirming the authenticity of the miracle. Uh, and his disapproval uh, may have easily ended in disaster. However, attributing the plot to Paul and Palladia is not without problems either. It would require assuming that the impostors learned beforehand about the needs and anxieties of the bishop and deftly took advantage of them, while Augustine was very naive all the way through. Thus, perhaps uh, 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 we should think about a more complex uh, scenario. Augustine didn't initiate 
the spectacle of the cure, but was hardly interested in checking the details of the story told by the siblings. Uh, indeed, it is possible that these details were fully elaborated only when Paul met Augustine on the day of his cure and had an occasion to realize what the latter expected. To whatever degree Augustine was involved uh, in these events, uh, Paul and Palladia played in them a major role and they played it well. Uh, we cannot say what they got instead. Uh, uh, the only thing uh, that, uh, um, that we can gather from uh, Augustine's sermon is, is that Paul uh, dined uh, with the bishop uh, on the evening of, of his cure. And while sitting at the bishop's table was certainly prestigious uh, 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 and, and, and may have helped to, to gain credibility in the eyes of the inhabitants uh, of Hippo, uh, that was hardly what the siblings were ultimately looking for. Uh, but did they get anything else, uh, uh, like some money or, or material support from the church or from, 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 from the people? Did they settle in Hippo or continue their career in other places? Well, suddenly we don't know. Uh, but the fact that Augustine uh, retold their story in the City of God a year or two later suggests that they were never unmasked. Whatever happened uh, in Hippo on Easter 425, whether the miracle was staged by Augustine or not, this dossier tells us something about the cult of saints in Africa in the early 5th century, uh, and above all about the concerns of the bishop who has just brought a new cult to his city. He must have asked himself uh, several questions. Uh, will people recognize the handful of ashes which were deposited in a newly built memori memorial shrine uh, as authentic relics? Will they believe in their power? Will these relics, relics give Hippo a strong position among other cities which boasted that they had the same saints' relics? Uh, will people trust the bishop and constantly acknowledge his authority? It seems that the four sermons preached in 425 may have brought Augustine closer to an affirmative answer to all these questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, you can see the virtual handshakes coming yep. up. And, and, um, I love them. <laughs> uh, apologies to online members of the audience for my letting you slowly into the room um, if you um, if you were waiting in, in the room. There's a couple of things that Microsoft Teams has changed about itself over the summer. And so this is a slowly emerging landscape of, of complications for me. Um, but thank you mostly for keeping keeping your silence. At this point, I would like to warmly encourage not just the um, in-house audience to raise their hands, they have real hands, but also if the online audience, if you have any comments or questions, you're welcome to either put them in the chat in which case we'll we'll take a look at them if you don't mind if i um um no actually i'll go back to my computer and i'll look at them and i'll call on people as as and when and and also um um uh, more importantly because it would be great to hear from you to raise your virtual hands and the way to do that um is if you go to the top of the screen um to i think for many people if you don't see it it'll be um, it'll be more. Oh my gosh, I don't see it in this case, but there's there should be an opportunity. In reactions. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I've just got a loss of. Uh, um, again, this something reactions. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, you can re raise your your virtual hand, and hopefully we'll see it, and we'll call on you. And if all else fails, just butt in. <laughs> but when we call on you, please do. You're warmly encouraged to turn on your video and audio so we can hear you. And if all else fails, as I say, put it into. Um, the chat. Um, we have a tradition uh, in this department um, to start with um, questions from the students of whom we have many in attendance. Um, this is, a, I think, an ongoing um, 
say sometimes we invoke this tradition and sometimes we don't. We don't particularly. Exactly. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> tradition it is. <laughs> well, but, but some of us think it's a good tradition, exactly. Mm -hmm. But um, it, I want to give the students a chance, and if they if they don't have anything forthcoming, then we're happy to move on um, to the other colleagues. And I'm of course um, happy to butt in myself, but I don't want to take over the show here. Vicenta, please. Thank you. Work option at the end. I don't quite understand. Was it like that, that they were working together, or that? Well, uh, uh, up to a point. So, so uh, I think. Well, I still. Well, uh, I have a, probably a personal problem with admitting that, that Augustine could have been responsible for for <laughs> that uh, for that directly. Uh, 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 but, but I, uh, I I'm happy to acknowledge. Uh, that they were imposters, and he well he just didn't ask uh, too many too many questions, and he knew he was not asking too many questions. No, 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 no. He was well. Uh, it is uh, uh, well. Augustine. Uh, uh, sometimes we have the impression that Augustine uh, uh, in the late four hundred twenties was not like Augustine uh, uh, in his best days. That somehow somehow he was well slow in uh, uh, well uh, responding to the brilliant argument uh, argument uh, of his uh, of his opponents. But 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 I really don't think that that uh, it was the case uh, uh, here. So, so I, I suppose that uh, uh, if he didn't check, it was his choice. Particular feeling sorry to your attention out of all the other ones. What is so special about it? Uh, so why he? Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, uh, um, what what was special uh, is the fact that they were seen by so many so many people, and uh, and that was something that, that Augustine. Well, even if if it was something real, well. Some things happened uh, in the uh, in the healing shrine. So so the the emotions and the expectations were so high that some people certainly felt uh, felt healed. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, even if it was well a real event, uh, August, Augustine couldn't you know lose this occasion uh, to uh, to uh, uh, to show it and tell. Tell to, to 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 everybody. Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? He, you see. Well, the relics are the relics are real. The relics are powerful. God uh, is uh, intervening again in the course of uh, uh, of human life. So I think that this was the the thing. Krista. Mm -hmm. Really clear and compelling, and I particularly like the way you foreground the agency of the person healed as well, but then mm -hmm. having something done to them, um, but they, they may be making decisions. Um, I want to ask about the story of the mother and the ten children, <laughs> um, <laughs> because it seems like there's a pattern there. Are, are there parallels? There's a kind of faint echo, possibly, of myopy. Um, mm -hmm. are, there, are there other? Um, Healing stories that involve family curses. And... Uh, now that I know about, uh, and uh, and th this story has even one more interesting element uh, that I haven't uh, I haven't mentioned. Uh, uh, so she uh, she wants to curse her eldest son because he was guilty. She goes to the baptistry. Why? I have no no idea. Well, the baptistry was a place of power, uh, 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 and we can see it. But but still. Quite strange a place to you know to to, to cast a curse, uh, and she well in going there she meets a demon uh, 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 who appears to her as a family member, uh, uh, <laughs> and and <laughs> and and the demon said well <laughs> why just the son <laughs> cast the curse on 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 everybody 
So, so uh, the story, the story is, uh, is extremely picturesque, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I was thinking rather ab ab about the ending uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the story, not not about uh, its uh, beginning, but 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 very re very recently, uh, uh, I exchanged uh, uh, a few emails with uh, Sophie Lon uh, uh, Ratcliffe who is interested in the beginning. And uh, well, if I can advertise it, uh, we will have a session uh, at, the, uh, at Leeds uh, on the International Medieval Congress on punitive miracles. And Krista will be talking about the beginning of this story. So we will learn. Uh, Sophie, yeah, please. Yeah, please. I'm interested in that. If we can, if can, those of us who know much more about earlier periods of antiquity, to, to, to what degree do we see people picking up on stories that they might have learned either from classical antiquity or from, from anything else? Because that's something we see, you know, with a lot of other sources in antiquity, so the theme of, of the story that you might find in Valdanius a couple of times, you know, repeated with different characters. Do we find sort of that, that sort of repetition of the stories? Okay, this is not a question for me, but, but to, to the to the audience. Yeah, yes, I, I'm quite curious. So yes, if you, yeah, yes, yeah. But you know that there, there, there are uh, so, so well. I, I'm uh, I cannot say anything about uh, about well classical antiquity, but, but you uh, sometimes you can see well serial uh, miracles or well events of this uh, uh, of this kind in the Bible. Uh, uh, so you have in the in the book of uh, uh, of Tobiah uh, uh, or is it Tobiah or Tobiah in? Uh, to Tabitha, thank you. Uh, 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 so you have uh, uh, you have uh, several brothers who are killed by a uh, uh, by a demon, but but I I I, uh, I don't think that there is so you know the, the well that's the the, the the genetic link between uh, between uh, these uh, these story these two stories. Perhaps there is well uh, well. Uh, well, uh, a shared uh, uh, model of, of thinking. Well, the the, the family uh, and the, the the subsequent family members can be touched by something like that. But I, I, I really I cannot tell. Yeah, I also noticed there's something in the chat. Is there? Should we check? Um, I was checking the chat because no one asked me questions. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> Did you have questions or are you just? I did actually, but then I saw the little orange dots. Uh -huh. okay. Okay. Um, I thank you so much for our fascinating talk. I'd love to hear more about the, the role of humour. Uh, we've all been laughing merrily at, uh -huh. um, and also in, in, in miracle stories from, from pagan antiquity, humour is really important in the Ecuadorian miracle inscriptions. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that some of the accounts are meant to be slightly funny. Uh, is that just the accident of how we're receiving this material, or do you think that's somehow part of the sort of theme of authenticity or part of the reaction one to that meant? Well, this is uh, this is a very good, but, but very, very, very difficult, uh, uh, very difficult question. So, so uh, when I uh, when I uh, read hagiography or monastic uh, monastic stories, uh, uh, well, I uh, I keep well smiling at least, and and there is there is in in, in John Moscus there is a. a well, I, I can't refrain myself. I will. I'll quote it. There's in John Moscus, uh, the the spiritual spiritual medal. Uh, it's, it's a later hagiographical uh, text or a collection of of uh, edifying stories. There's one about a about a monk who had a who had a pupil, uh, and uh, and the, the the pupil was not you know working and and praying hard enough, and 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 the monk. Uh, uh, Kept telling him you have to change your way of life, but he didn't, and he died. 
and and the monk uh, 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 thought, uh, uh, well, what could have happened to uh, to him, and prayed God to show him, and uh, and 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 suddenly he saw a river of fire, uh, and uh, and this young pupil standing uh, up to his chin in uh, in the river of fire, and and the monk says, and didn't didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? And and, and you see, and and the young monk says, uh, well. Thanks. It's not so bad, uh, Father. Thanks to your prayers, I'm standing on the head of a bishop. So <laughs> this is a wonderful story, and and I strongly suspect uh, that the humor was uh, was was meant. But in in several cases, I, I just don't know. And and and. Augustine was an intelligent man, but I'm not sure about his sense of humor. So uh, we know, for instance, we know. I mean, Augustine. When Augustine read, Augustine commented uh, uh, on the Golden Ass uh, uh, of Apuleius, and 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 he took it everything very seriously. I, I mean, he he told it was a lie, uh, uh, it was impossible, but he he didn't see any uh, any humor. So uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, 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 so, well, uh, in, in this case, I would think no, uh, but, 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 but I'm not sure. Yes. Hi, Natalie, can you hear us? Yes, the hand disappeared, but, but. Sorry, um, I'm not used to Teams. Uh, me, me neither, but, but we, we can hear you. We can, we can hear you, Anthony. Yeah, my, my browser doesn't support the camera, but anyway, it's great to see you. Uh, I, was, <laughs> I was wondering um, if the whole thing would have worked with a local saint as well. Or did it have to be a biblical saint or like something more powerful, something new? Uh, well, uh, I, I, I think that uh, the, uh, the novelty, it's a, it's a complex issue because uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, because we are in, in the period when the, the, the belief or in contemporary miracles uh, really only, only is about to or, or is starting uh, uh, at least in the uh, uh, at least in the west so uh, on the on the one hand uh, uh, you have to somehow to uh, uh, to convince people that, uh, uh, that the contemporary miracles uh, do happen and it's not that easy because they are not accustomed to uh, to that. So, so the novelty somehow can uh, the, the novelty of the phenomenon, the entire phenomenon, can uh, uh, can work against you. But interestingly enough, uh, 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 all the miracles, or well, to be on a safe side, most uh, definitely most miracles uh, uh, um, which we can witness to uh, uh, in the West at the time are the miracles uh, uh, performed by the well by new relics so we we are in africa uh, and uh, at that time uh, uh, africa has a long list of uh, venerated and widely known saints whose graves are identified there is san cyprian in africa well a, a most one of the most uh, uh, renowned uh, 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 Western uh, martyrs. Uh, 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 there are Silita martyrs. There is Perpetua and uh, and and Felicitas, uh, and their graves are in Carthage. But uh, we do not hear at all uh, about the uh, uh, um, uh, about the miracles uh, in uh, uh, in those places. So it seems to me that you needed something new. So uh, uh, a discovery. Uh, of uh, of new relics, a transfer uh, of uh, of new relics, a ceremony, uh, something. Uh, uh, it was not that uh, well. Uh, at some point, someone uh, uh, well, it, it just didn't happen. That, that uh, at some point, someone went uh, uh, to to the tomb of Saint Cyprian, and voila, we have a miracle. No, something has to be something had to be new. So yes, I think that the novelty was important. 
Yes, um, I was just think as you can guess, probably, I was thinking about salsa of Tipasa, which is a local saint, which like the whole passion talks about something miraculously happening there, but it's strongly, strongly connected to the city itself. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very interesting what you what you what you said, because we do have some a few new passions of saints in the fifth century. Yes. Salsa and Marciana. But and they they definitely are changing. So the texts are different from Perpetua and Felicity or from Cyprian. But um, we d we never have new text about old saints describing miracles, don't we? No, no. Mm -hmm. And I I think so. So uh, I would uh, well you you obviously know about uh, uh, about about well both Marcian and especially Salsa much more than uh, than me. But uh, but but I would think that the chronology of the uh, of the development of the belief was uh, was the following. So in uh, uh, around 420, the relics of Saint Stephen arrive in Africa, and we can see it in the City of God. So uh, th th there are ceremonies organized. Uh, 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 well, something is going on in the, uh, uh, in the cities, and the relics uh, uh, of St. Stephen come to Africa already with a literary dossier suggesting that these are miracle performing uh, relics. So there's a, a, a very, very, very heavy start, a well marked start, and and I would suppose suppose that uh, once this uh, belief uh, in the in the in the miracles performed by the uh, relics of the martyrs were established thanks to Cyprian, then uh, uh, we witnessed well a local reaction and and uh, uh, and the passio of. Uh, salsa and, and and Marciana, well, they may be read as a uh, well local response to uh, uh, to the cult of Saint Stephen. I'm not sure whether you would agree. Definitely, definitely. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So this story came from that. So what what was um what do you think like obviously you say they needed like the, the kind of credence from the bishop but like what what why why what was their deal like after this? Uh, so so what was their purpose? Uh, yeah. So well, uh, I would suppose that, that they were just earning their life. Uh, 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 in this way, uh, uh, at least what we can see in uh, uh, in in other stories uh, 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 about you know the the, the wandering uh, uh, miracle workers, well, it is so. So, uh, so I would suppose that that was that. Uh, but but uh, uh, you uh, you touched upon a point which which is also quite quite important. I mean uh, about the about the libellus, how it was. Uh, um, uh, how it was written, because if Paul, Paul and Palladia were really from Cappadocia, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure, but, but well, assuming that, well, if they were from uh, from from uh, uh, um, from Anatolia at least, uh, we can safely assume that they were Greek speakers. Uh, so uh, the story, uh, if they had a story uh, which was ready. It was presented in Greek, uh, so ha someone had to translate it. It could have been Augustine. His Greek was not perfect, but, but it could have been him. Uh, but in the process of translation, the story may have may have changed. So, so even if we assumed that, 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 that there was a real story, so the the, the, the final product uh, 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 is partly uh, Augustine's work. I didn't. They were Greek speakers, but are you so sure that in all those travels in Italy they couldn't have learned Latin? No, I, I'm not sure. Yes, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, but but certainly, I mean, if you read uh, 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 Libellus, it, it's well written. It, it's it, it's a decent Latin, well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and there are 
online audience, um, Stefan Arvidalianu, I think, has a question, if you could. Yeah, thanks a lot for this paper. Uh, it was wonderful to, to hear this. Um, I, I was especially um, really interested in, in, in uh, um, rivalry about the, um, the cities. Um, what came to my mind, I, I was working some years ago also on Hippo Regius, uh, on funerary inscriptions from, uh, from late antiquity. And if I remember well, um, it was not Augustine himself who um, dedicated the shrine uh, to Stephen, but Heraclius. Um, yes. And I think this could also fit quite well to your um, hypothesis that, um, yeah, uh, Augustine is working in, in a team uh, here. So he doesn't want to uh, put himself on, on the most privileged uh, spot, um, let's say, as a donor of this shrine. Although we know um, that at some later point, I think if I remember well, um, he's responsible for some depictions in the shrine itself. So he uh, takes care about the um, representation in the shrine itself. Uh, but initially, that's quite interesting. And I, I would say that would fit also quite well to your hypothesis that uh, he takes himself out of the donation of the shrine and himself. Um, yeah, but... I don't know what you think about this. Okay, okay. Th thank you very much for 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 uh, bringing uh, uh, Heraclius in. Yeah, yes, Heraclius. Uh, uh, well, we uh, it's probably sorry for that. Uh, 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 Heraclius uh, uh, was uh, uh, Augustine's uh, deacon uh, at uh, at that point, but but he was his well beloved pupil because Augustine uh, uh, well actually named his his, his successor uh, at the sea uh, at the sea of uh, of hippo so Heraclius was was, uh, was a quite uh, rich man he funded the uh, 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 the martyrium I don't remember about uh, 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 about the paintings or or, or, or decoration but but well Quite evidently, yes, uh, uh, Heraclius, Heraclius was there. Mm -hmm. So it's perhaps also a preparation for Heraclius himself, so he yes, can yes, yes, also yes, 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 take yes, part yes, of, yes, of the power of the relics. Obviously, and, and people people knew that uh, that uh, people knew very well who paid for the shrine. Yes, and and yeah. yes, we we know it from other uh, Augustine sermons. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and about uh, if if I can if I can add a word uh, about the uh, 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 about the rivalry uh, uh, between the between the cities that uh, uh, that Stefan has uh, has mentioned, we really can see it uh, uh, also in the in the field of the of the cult of saints. And sometimes, uh, well, rarely, but but we can see that the, the, the uh, rivalry between the which existed long before is translated in, into the cult of saints. That there is uh, in the well slightly, but just slightly uh, a later period uh, uh, in the collection of the miracles of Saint Tecla, we find a story about the um, about the bishop of uh, Tarsus who uh, uh, forbade uh, his congregation to visit Seleucia in Isauria for the annual feast of Saint Tecla. And, and uh, Seleucia and Tarsus well, were rival cities uh, before. And, uh, but uh, uh, according to the, to the miracles, uh, on the following night, uh, Tecla appeared in the middle of the city of Tarsus, uh, uh, running through the streets and clapping her hands and crying, you will die. And he died. <laughs> and he died. Um, so you were saying earlier that there's a change at this point in terms of belief in contemporary miracles. Obviously, the miracles of the Bible were the easy and fun, the contemporary miracles, not so, which obviously you know, is really interesting in terms of how to think of divine power. But so when contemporary miracles weren't happening, the relics, did they have different kinds of powers? I mean, how were people perceiving the relics as sources of power? under those sorts of conditions, under those um, intellectual conditions. Yeah, uh, 
I think that it actually started with Redix, although our evidence uh, is not clear about it, uh, because we uh, we have the the first uh, testimonies about uh, uh, about the power of Redix, power the power of Redix tormenting tormenting demons. For for the for the first generation, there there are no well corporeal healings. It's, it's just about demons. Uh, uh, so the, the earliest testimonies came from the very beginning of 360s, uh, especially from Hilaire of Poitiers. Uh, uh, and, and, and from the 360s on, we have quite a lot of evidence, but not before. But at the same time, uh, uh, around 360 also, uh, Athanasius of Alexandria writes the life of Anthony, uh, which is the first, well, Life, uh, well, first hagiographical work of the of the new type, the the, uh, the Vita, and it is also the, the the first attestation to monastic miracles. So I would say that something was in the air. Uh, so somehow people were ready at this point to to, to accept the idea that the miracles are uh, are uh, uh, are back, uh, and uh, uh, at the uh, if we are looking at at, at Redix, uh, I'm. Uh, I, I, I may be too positivist, but 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 I, but, but I think uh, that it's easier to explain the beginning uh, of this uh, uh, re-emerged belief in in miracles if we admit that people who visited the shrines of the martyrs uh, 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 of the new shrines of the martyrs built after the persecution, they really witnessed to uh, witness to something, uh, 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 and uh, and it is it is interesting uh, that the first authors tell just about the demons uh, and even not demons being cast away, uh, demons rather confessing their crimes and people crying, uh, well, jumping, behaving in a very strange way. So I suppose that we may think about it as a, well, obviously very rhetorical and elaborated description of what really uh, happens at the, at the shrines. So these places were visited by by many people, so we are at the beginning of the uh, uh, of the phenomenon of Christian uh, pilgrimages. Uh, they so they bring vi they bring visitors, uh, uh, and interestingly, we can see that these visitors distribute uh, money uh, or, or alms much more readily readily in the shrines of martyrs than in the uh, you know ecclesia or the the, the the episcopal churches, and and because of that. Uh, uh, these places uh, attract people, various people in need. Uh, so the poor and the the, the ill, uh, the, the ones who were well, who just didn't have food, uh, roof overhead, uh, uh, um, uh, and so on. And some of these people uh, uh, are uh, uh, well are uh, uh, considered to be. Uh, 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 by others, and then probably also by by themselves, as uh, 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 as uh, possessed by uh, by evil spirits. So so it it must have been. Uh, I think it must have been really a a strange experience to to, to enter a martyrial shrine uh, and see all the uh, 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 all these people. Well, some of them per, per, were probably we're looking for audience. It's interesting that when you are in some cities, I have this, I have seen it in Warsaw, you can very rarely today, but you can find, well, mentally disturbed people attracted by the churches, but they are always, the churches, they're not peripheral churches, they're churches in the, you know, in the middle of the city, which are visited by, by, by numerous, well, faithful or, well, pilgrims, visitors, whatever. Uh, so, and I think that the observation uh, of, of, of strange behaviors of, the, of these people may have been the beginning uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the belief uh, uh, in contemporary miracles. And only in the next generation, uh, you can see that the proper uh, healing miracles or the prediction of the, uh, of the things to uh, things to come, because uh, uh, once this uh, uh, belief appeared, uh, uh, you had the biblical pattern. So if Jesus uh, cast away demons, healed the sick, 
and predicted the future. And we can see that the martyrs uh, uh, have power over demons, so they probably should have power over uh, 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 over diseases and, and 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 the power to to product uh, to, to to you know predict the future. So that's what I would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just just the kind of note on that, just because it popped in my head that after Constantine, it took a while for martyrs to become sort of benign from the point of view of the church again, because they were during the persecutions, they could be seen as very disruptive to the authority of the bishop. The yes, of course, to and they were safe. Now, at that yeah. point, they were safe in the uh, in the graves. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, but, but 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 it really, yes, because the, uh, uh, and I think, well, I think that the end of the persecution was also important. So, 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 uh, 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 I really think that uh, that uh, in the 300 in in the second or the third decade of the uh, of the fourth century, uh, well, the Christians started to to to, to look at this word uh, uh, and see it as not just a you know the, a corridor that you have to pass going to uh, going to heaven, but a, a, as a place in which God uh, uh, well acts uh, uh, well again. So and you you can see it in Eusebius of Caesarea actually. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Eusebius, uh, uh, for, for Eusebius, God is active uh, and is active uh, uh, partly because of the uh, 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 of the sacrifice of the martyrs. Uh, uh, if you read the, the, the first uh, chapters of the uh, 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 of the ecclesiastical history, so so somehow, uh, and maybe this is what was in there. So 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 people thought uh, about the end of the persecution. Uh, uh, which was the longest, uh, well, re relatively certainly the, the, the blood is persecution as uh, well as a, as a sort of of miracle. And then they uh, uh, they uh, yes they, they start to build the shrines to the martyrs, which are not a challenge to the to the power of the uh, of the bishops uh, anymore. Uh, and then they start to you know translate their uh, uh, their bonds. It is with the bonds. It, it's well. This this lapse of time, perhaps it was it was also important because you know it's it's more difficult to open the tomb ten years after or five years after the death. Uh, and well, fifty years would be quite all right, I suppose, in most places. Uh, so I was quite interested in the authority the bishops had in regards to their cities. We've mm -hmm. got the story of uh, Ambrose. Uh, forcing Theodosius the Great to repent uh, during after the uh, Thessalonian massacres. So I was wondering if that is that a um, kind of a, a personal authority that he has, or is that locational? Would a uh, bishop from Africa be able to wield that same kind of authority? Uh, Ambrose is it's probably quite specific, and uh, but but. Um, Mm, first, uh, I must say that Ambrose that we can uh, that we can see is Ambrose that he wanted to show us. So we know Ambrose and and the, uh, and the history about Ambrose and Theodosius mostly from his letters and from the life of Ambrose, who was written by a member of his uh, of his clergy. So we cannot. Uh, 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 so it. Uh, Ambrose's power seems to be to be very special, but we cannot face. Uh, I think we can't take it at at face uh, uh, value. Uh, in in Africa, uh, I would say that uh, that the position of of the bishop was not that self uh, self evident. So uh, Augustine, uh, uh, well, Augustine had a friend, the governor of uh, of Africa, who was set at some point sentenced to death uh, uh, for treason and Augustine used all his power to stop this he failed uh, 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 and uh, and you you can see other uh, situations uh, uh, in which the the, 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 the the bishops are quite helpless in in dealing not with the emperor but but with the you know the the, the local administration so uh, uh, we are not in a period in well later on uh, 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 when uh, the Roman Empire is, is falling apart. Well, there are places, at least some places, uh, in which the, the bishops will took over the, 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 the power of local magistrates. But uh, in the uh, 400, 
20s, well, Africa is a very rich, very safe and, and very well governed uh, uh, province uh, of the empire. So they don't know that the, the Vandals will come just in a couple of years. So, so I would say no, not too much. Question. Um, I have a slight anxiety. There's a dot on the top of the chat. And my computer at least won't show me the chat. And if there's anything in the chat that someone's aware of that um, Let, that we're ignoring, do please let's see. Um, just that, well, there's it's from you. Greetings uh, <laughs> to people from the very beginning about oh. about keeping their phones, uh, microphones off and everything. And Hannah has thanked you for uh -huh. a very lovely talk. Thank you. Uh, which we will all join in, in mm -hmm. um, but before that, I just want to um, say I've put up the poster, as I promised I would, with all of our um, lectures in this series, Ex Africa Center, Eloquid Novi. And um, next week, we will get something a little bit more um, uh, physical, um, I suppose. Um, well, it is, we have been talking about the physicality of the ashes, now haven't we? Bigger physical. <laughs> It's going to take us to um, North African monumental architecture in the Hellenistic period within the frame of regionalism, um, which is also a very good way to be um, uh, emphasizing this area of the world that we don't talk about enough that we're going to be focusing on for the entire term. And so, um, again, we um, hope for an ample in person audience. Um, Joe doesn't have that far to come to us, but so it's an effort for Joe to so we want to um, mourn the effort. and. Um, Likewise, welcome all, all those online who otherwise won't be able to join us. Uh, and hopefully it'll work even better next week than it did today, now that we're all getting getting better at it. So um, if everyone else could join me in thanking Robert for a fantastic talk and very interesting Q&A afterwards. And then uh, come down and drink, drink and continue to drink and eat and continue to ask questions, those of us in person. So thanks again, Robert. Thank you very much.